don't know whether I read something or heard something that you got in with a bad crowd. I wanted to know if that was true, <laughs> what a bad crowd means. Robbing cars, what is it? Sam Kane was on the sideline. He was coming back from injury. The bastard was, you know, squirting water on me and um, just stuff like that. Like, they're still some of my best friends. And man, I was a bit of a, especially when I was in my young, like early 20s, man, I thought I was a man. It was, it was an amazing experience. I didn't look anyone specifically in the eye. You try, it's a weird thing. You're like trying to catch people's eyes, but everyone's just looking straight ahead. He's on a pedestal, which I now understand rightfully so. But um, when I first got here, I was just like, why the fuck is this dude like? This ain't Dan Carter. Yeah. yeah. This ain't Dan Carter. No, no. <laughs> you know, Dane Coles, obviously annoying as shit. Yeah, he's a he's hard nosed bastard, man. Like he expects so highly of of everyone but he expects so highly of himself as well. Like, you know, a lot of the Kiwis wouldn't have had a clue who Ty Furlong, Dan Sheehan, and uh, Andrew Porter were. I am Jim Hamilton, and I'm here in rainy Dublin to meet the country's favorite adopted son, James Lowe. James moved to Leinster in 2017, and he has made a huge impact at provincial level, and most recently, international rugby. We discussed how it felt winning a series against the All Blacks, the treatment he received from his country of birth, and some of his many famous teammates. Enjoy. Right, James, home away from home. Yeah. We're in Ireland. Did you think back in the day when you were in New Zealand that you'd be walking this great path, not with a great <laughs> man with myself? Uh, I wouldn't. Wouldn't uh, talk down about yourself, Jim, but you know it's um, oh, it's been some journey. You know, it's uh, crazy how how things happen. But you know, I don't regret my choice um, by any means. I've loved my time, loved the choice that I made, and can't believe you know how far we've actually come over here. Yeah, it's yeah. been class, and I think it's been class to watch your evolution and. Looking back through the archives and reading some of the articles as well, it was never meant to be you stood here. It was meant to be Israel Dag. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, I knew that actually. And he actually, funny, funnily enough, when we were in Wellington after that third Test match, he was he came in and um, he had told a few of the boys, and like I didn't tell anyone there. It was um, I think they actually tried to get someone between Israel Dag and me as well. So um, you know the stars aligned, fortunately, and um, you know Leo gave me a call and. Uh, sent through an email and you know that was that's how she uh, came about and at that point was the island stuff spoken about or was it an opportunity to move away from New Zealand it, it, it was said right at the start you know obviously there's a potential there with the residency rule to to represent Ireland one day but I mean I hadn't I hadn't thought that through too much and knew if the opportunity came in if I played good rugby then you know it could it could come true but uh, I just knew like I signed when I was 23 24 I knew that there was still I still had something to give back to rugby and I knew I wasn't done I thought I could get better and to challenge myself I guess in a new environment uh, away from the, the safety net to mum and dad and home and all your friends and family um, you know it was nice um, can't complain at all, yeah. Yeah, because we are going over at old ground. Yeah. I know it's a story that's been yeah. told and we're kind of setting the scene for people that might not know mm. your backstory and have only seen the highlight reels of you mm. scoring tries and making, no, making big hits, <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> that we will get on to that point. But what about your life in New Zealand? Was it a case of you needed to get out of there. I don't know whether I read something or heard something that you got in with a bad crowd. I wanted to know if that was true and what a bad crowd means. Robbing cars, what is it? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say I'd get into a bad crowd or anything. I, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was just frustrated, you know, more than anything. Um, you know, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't quite in a bad crowd, but I was, like I said, I was frustrated that I hadn't quite been given the opportunity that I felt I deserved. But I mean, in reflection of that, it's probably a bit of my own doing in terms of I was still very young and naive, and um, you know, I probably wasn't doing the things that coaches wanted me to see. Like I was, to me, I was still performing, and but I was getting there, whether that was through luck or. Um, you know, right opportunities at the right time, but I can see why I wouldn't pick me either. But, why? <laughs> um, man, I was a bit of a, especially when I was in my young, like early 20s, man, I thought I was the man. Like that was, <laughs> like that's the easiest. Confident. Like, yeah, I was very, very confident. And I'm still a very confident person, but now I can take it on the chin and understand when I need to, when I need to, um, you know, be, be put back into line. 
Um, you know, I've always had an air of confidence and that probably worked against me in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I probably wasn't the team player that I'd, I'd consider myself that I probably am now. Um, the, the whole selfless thing of doing what's right for the team. Like as a winger, you know, you're, you're expected to, to finish and score tries. I was doing that, but, um, you know, I wanted to see my own name and headlights and things like that. And that's, I can see why you wouldn't pick me because of those reasons. It's not, that's not the type of person you want in a team environment. So, um, you know, I thought I could take an opportunity and, you know, at the start, I probably thought, oh, it's only three years if I, if I, you know, if I don't like it or if I don't achieve what I wanted to achieve over in Ireland, then I could go back to New Zealand and probably give it another crack being a bit more mature. But, you know, I came over here and, um, you know, I've absolutely loved it. It's not like I turned over a new leaf. Leaf, it was more of a grow, like a bit of growing pains more than anything, you know, turning from a, you know, a boy into a man, you could say, or, um, but some things you've got to figure out, and unfortunately I figured it out a bit later than usual, so um, that's pretty much it, man. So when you turned up at Leinster, confident, <laughs> not arrogant, yeah. who opened their arms first when you walked through the door because <laughs> there were some superstars in such a successful team? Yeah, um, I actually arrived at a bit of a, um, not a, it was a bit of a weird time because the internationals had just gone away for um, the November Test Series, so I'd come in in a download week, is what, is what we call it, and a few of the boys were in getting one of their gyms done, and um, you know I was just there with a physio, and actually Max Deegan came up to me, um, young and bright-eyed Max Deegan at the time, and he's like, oh, we're actually going out tonight if you wanted to come, and uh, a place called Zico. Um, here in Dublin, which is a bit of a student bar down a, a flight of dingy stairs. And um, that's where I actually met a lot of the boys. Uh, Peter Dooley at the time, he took me under his wing. Josh Van Der Flyer was there. Um, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was a good welcoming experience into, into life in Dublin. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we hit it off that night, yeah. Did they get to see the real James Lowe, <laughs> or did they get in a uh, hands version? What did they get? Uh, I, I was trying to keep it safe, but in fairness, I'd thrown my guts up by late that night. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, it, it wasn't it wasn't pretty. Now I've played a few derbies. Mm. I love them, but the Leinster Munster. It seems like there's a real edge when you talk about the relationships in that Irish squad. Mm. But then you go out on the pitch, and it's like that. It is deep rooted. Uh, it feels. Yeah, it's. Um, you know, I don't like. I'd question if there was a bigger, bigger rivalry in in, in world club rugby. You know, like um, there's not many places that would sell out a pack of Viva. There's not many places um, where literally, you know, it's it's an absolute bloodbath. You, I'm, I'm very, very good friends with a lot of those Munster boys, but as soon as they put on a red jumper and I put on a blue jumper, it's it's absolute a war, and. The fans love it, you know, we love it. It's, it's nothing like putting yourself in a pressure cauldron um, against people that you know so, so well to see who comes out um, on the other end. And fortunately, I've come here at a time where Leinster have been dominant. So, you know, I haven't been the little brother in terms of that, that derby, uh, that derby mentality. And uh, mate, it's, it's absolute war when, it, when the boys come up against each other. And, you know, a little bit of bragging points, I guess, when you do go into camp. and. Um, mate, I, weirdly enough, I do really, really enjoy the derby. I like going down there. I know, you know, I've been recarded down there once, but it was, you know, I still love going down there. There's no bad blood, uh, in that, but, you know, if there's, if there's any sort of push and shove, you know, we all get involved. What about when you stood on the wing? What are the Irish fans, uh, Munster fans <laughs> yeah. saying to you? Do they give you a bit of love or stick? Um, oh, no, nah, there's always the usual hair joke and... Um, What's the usual hair, Joe? I like uh, the hair. What do they yeah. say? Oh, no, they just, oh, you know, oh, tie your hair up again. Just basics, like basics, cheap slags. Like, it's, it's low-hanging fruit, you know. <laughs> like, that's, that's all I really get, I'm not going to lie. Um, but, no, there's nothing too bad. It's just, it's cheek and tongue. That's all it is, man. Mm. There's, nothing, there's no venom in it. Um, you know, it's all love at the end of the day, and I'm really, really, um, yeah, I love those derbies, man. Yeah. yeah, I've been to I've been to crueler places where you hear some crueler things on the wing, but um, no, heading down to down to Munster territory is not not too bad. No. Yeah. What about the profile of some of the players? I mean, I could go through the list. Jordan yeah. Sexton would be frontlining that, but they've got 
a lot of high profile players. Mm. Would you have known much about them, honestly, when you were back in New Zealand? Or like, did you just know that Leinster were a fantastic team? I, hand on my heart, I didn't even know Leinster were a fantastic team. I'm not going to lie until, um, until questions were asked if I'd come over. And then I did a bit of homework and realised they, they were one of the powerhouses in, in Europe. And, um, you know, I obviously the Lions tour just happened before I'd come over. So I met a few of the boys, the likes of Sean O'Brien, Johnny Sexton. Um, and, you know, like when I first got here, everyone was very, very friendly. Um, obviously, when a new person comes, uh, it's fortunate enough you come here and you land and you've got 30, 40 friends straight away. Um, and those boys wanted to make me feel welcome. And um, I just felt like it was a weird thing because, you know, obviously there's Sexo who's, you know, 100 tests for Ireland, Lions tours, uh, all the accolades you could you could think of. And um, he's on a pedestal, which I now understand rightfully so. But um, when I first got here, I was just like, why the fuck is this dude like? This ain't Dan Carter. Yeah. yeah. This ain't Dan Carter. No, no. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was it was a funny sort of teething period. And I thought I'd try and peg him down as much as I can. But, I mean, you, you never go after the king, though, do you? No, you don't. How does one peg? And, uh, yeah. How, how do you peg him down? How does one peg oh, him under? Man, he actually missed a heap of kicks. Um, it was actually the year they won their um, the Grand Slam. It was 17, 18, I think. And he missed a heap of kicks. And I just went at him on Twitter asking if anyone knew a kicking coach sort of thing for a friend. and um, Just little jabs like that but um, you know Sexto and I get on like a house on fire now and um, there's definitely a reason why he's been so successful and still doing it at 37 years of age man he's a full-time professional and um, you know he's treated like a king in there and rightly so yeah absolutely can he let his hair down in that changing room or not because we see the serious <laughs> yeah. side of him yeah he can in the changing room um, for sure and you know he's a full-time competitor but when he's around when he's around the boys he's you know the childish old man that he is um he can take take abuse and give abuse just as well so um yeah it's unfortunate that the real world doesn't see uh the rest of the world sorry doesn't see uh what sex is like with his hair down yeah well we were talking about it uh, just off camera weren't we around mm. sexton and these characters and owen farrell the likes of them yeah. high profile serious and they look mm. serious you know peter omani as well when you watch yeah. him on the pitch not when we saw him beat the all blacks yeah, and he yeah, was yeah. getting loose after that yes. but there's this kind of microscope on the Irish yeah. players. There isn't the access that we get to walk down this lovely wet <laughs> canal. Like you yeah. just don't get it. It's similar to what it's like in New Zealand as well. Yeah. It's quite closed off. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Like those boys are absolutely hilarious in camp, man. They, um, they're the absolute professionals when it comes to training and um, around the environment. But man, outside of it, like watching football, you know, doing playing cards, you know, after games, having beers. They're very, very normal people underneath it all. Uh, like you said, it's unfortunate that not everyone gets to see it. Yeah, absolutely. I never thought in a million years that I'd get the opportunity to, you know, play against New Zealand. Um, you know, the country of my birth, the team I wanted to play for growing up. I remember Sam Kane was on the sideline, he was coming back from injury, the bastard was, you know, squirting water on me and um, just stuff like that. Like, they're still some of my best friends. And What are you doing? Who are you looking at? <laughs> like, how does it work? It was it was an amazing experience. I didn't look anyone specifically in the eye. You try. It's a weird thing. You like trying to catch people's eyes, but everyone's just looking straight ahead. He's a he's a friend of mine. I knew it was coming. But when he was starting to go, someone like Gary Ringrose or something, I was like, mate, Gary's one of the nicest guys. Please try and pick on someone apart from Gary right now. Um, you know, Dane Cole's obviously annoying as shit. So within your first year of being in Ireland, I love how you say, say Ireland for me. Ireland. Oh, yeah. you say, yeah, it's yeah. different how you normally say it. <laughs> Stop. So being here in Ireland yeah. and being here a year for you, you got to witness an international match 2018 where Ireland beat the All Blacks. Yeah. How was it watching that? Like mixed feelings or not? I mean, um, I yeah, it was a it was a cool experience. I'm not going to lie. Uh, at the Aviva, my parents were here at the time. Um, so they came over uh, and we were sitting pretty in a nice Bank of Ireland box and um, you know it was a I had a foot in both camps sort of at the time you know I'd only been over for a little while and um, you know it was an amazing experience the game was the game was amazing it was it was a typical 
you know, Ireland, New Zealand match, you know, Stockdale scored that absolute screamer in the corner and we were literally just up from that. We're like, holy shit, is this going to happen? Um, and then it did and, you know, it was a, a sense of, you know, huge, I guess, pride of everyone and, um, you know, to be there sitting, sitting pretty in the stands, having Guinness with my parents, it was a, it was a bit of an experience and, shit, I never knew one day that I'd get the chance to play against New Zealand in there and, you know, did and, um, it was, yeah, it was a cool experience, yeah. Yeah, because the momentum was gathering on your career around that point yeah. where people were talking about the residency, mm. the fact that you'd come over potentially with the ability to play for yeah. Ireland, and it started to accelerate, probably after that game, <laughs> really, because of the association, naturally. Yeah. When was your appetite really, like, right, I'm really going to go for it now? You know, like, after my, my first year, you know, I was... Well, there's a silly rule where only two New Zealanders and Australians can play at one time in Leinster. <laughs> I don't know actually what the rule is, but um, so myself, Jamison and Scott Fardy at the time were the three. And to be fair, I was probably the most expendable because we had a, a very, very strong back three at the time. Rob Carney, Fergus McFadden and Issa Nathiwa. Um And, you know, Jamo was always going to play 30, 40 minutes behind Luki and Scott Fardy was still at his, you know, pre-World Cup best. Um, so, like, I kind of knew after that, through the frustration of not being picked for that, that I really wanted to give it a decent crack here, that I wanted to, you know, after that, play for, potentially play for Ireland and put my hand up, and I was hungry enough after that. And that was, you know, through disappointment, which I knew wasn't really my fault, because I felt like if I was, you know, if I was allowed to play, I definitely would have. Um, and I, you know, I didn't pissed me off a little bit, knew it wasn't anyone's fault, but, um, you know, after that Heineken Cup uh, final that I wasn't involved and in, that's when I was like, oh yeah, let's, I think this is, this is time to uh, kick it into gear and hopefully, um, you know, in a few years time be able to play. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, your career just went from strength to strength, maybe after mm. that moment, like you just mentioned there. What was the outside perception <clears throat> and the media and being in Ireland where, <laughs> There'd been a bit of a pushback, I suppose, CJ Stander yeah. being one, Bundiaki a little bit as well. Yeah. And you publicly out, out or well, we're all saying it in the media, yeah. that, you know, you're going to be playing for Ireland in a couple yeah. of years, all being well. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a funny time, you know, like even for me, like I was, man, I was born in New Zealand. I grew up wanting to be an All Black. I'd represented New Zealand, fortunately, in other sports. I, you know, I'd, you know, my family's from New Zealand, like, you know, I knew that this opportunity could come and I understood why people would be pissed off. But I, I took a stance of like, look, this isn't my fault. Like, you understand that I came over here for an opportunity. Um, if I'm good enough after three years of residency, then, um, you know, when I get picked, I get picked. If I don't, I don't. I'm not going to, I'm not blaming anyone for that. And, you know, I've been here coming up five years. I'll be applying for a passport shortly. Um, and I don't see myself going anywhere in the next few years. So, um, man, I even when I retire from rugby, I could see myself having a life in Ireland, like easily enough. We we absolutely love it here. Um, so, man, people can say what they want; they do anyway. So, I took it on the chin, and you know, I pretty much agreed with them half <laughs> half of them anyway. I said it was a pretty stupid rule, but sure, look. I benefited from it, so, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, mate, it's great that you're being so candid about it because the way that I see it is it's professional sport. Yeah. A lot's changed, and I love the fact that Ireland still have that tradition. And mm. I was talking to you off camera about the taxi driver, <laughs> and he said, oh, what are you doing in Dublin? I said, oh, I'm interviewing James Lowe. And I could see his eyes were right. I said, <laughs> what? He said, oh, I'm a Munster man. I was like, all right. You're an Irishman, though. He says, "Yeah, Munster man. No, I'm not too sure. You know, I'm not." And I said, "Tell me why." He said, "Oh, you know." And he couldn't really contextualise yeah. it why because he was a traditionalist. Like he's yeah. thinking Irish people coming through. But I love the fact now that you know you've mm. come over, and I'm sure many of the Irish public watching the way that you played. But then the pressure would come on because once you've got the momentum, yeah. he's going to play. You've got to rock up, right? Yeah, you've, you've got, got to, to sing the up. anthem. Yeah. And I can say this because I played for Scotland with an English accent, <laughs> and people. Have are looking at me and it yeah. was a little bit weird for me like singing yeah. the Scottish anthem albeit I grew up in, mm. with a Scottish dad but I grew up English you yeah. know? and people don't like that what was oh. it like singing the anthem first time um yeah it was a special enough feeling like I remember my debut like it was yesterday man I um 
albeit in an empty stadium, um, you know, it was an amazing um, sense of pride and joy, uh, achievement, you know, like the, like the only thing I really know how to do in life is play rugby, I'm not going to lie, like that's, you know, that's what I'm, that's what I'm half decent at, you know, and um, to be able to give the op be given the opportunity to represent Ireland at the highest level. Uh, we were going up against Wales, man, and like, you looked at that Welsh back three at the time, it wasn't, oh, I mean, they're still very, very good. You, uh, Josh Adams, uh, Lee Halfpenny, um, you know, they're very, very, it's a very experienced back three, and, you know, we played well, and, um, you know, managed to get, get the win, and I scored on debut, which is something, you know, as a child you dream of, especially as a winger, to be able to get off the mark, and, um, mate, it was an amazing occasion and, you know, something I've fucking cherished every single time, being able to represent Ireland. Yeah, and that mm. was in 2020, so that was kind of in the shadows with COVID and everything yeah, that was happening yeah, with yeah. that. Yeah, of course. But then things opened back up a year later, yeah. 2021, and you look down the fixture list, I suppose, for you personally, you're looking at every game is a big game. Mm. But I suppose yeah. emotionally for you, seeing the All Blacks on that <laughs> list. Yeah. Oh, it gives me like a little bit of a shiver now thinking about it. You know, every <clears throat> I never thought in a million years that I'd get the opportunity to, you know, play against New Zealand. Um, you know, the country of my birth, the team I wanted to play for growing up. Um, you know, like uh, when I saw that, when I saw that fixture, I knew that I was going to do everything I absolutely could uh, to make sure I was fit for that game and. Uh, when that game came, the, the week leading in was, uh, I wouldn't say it's like any other week, it's not every time you get to play New Zealand at home, um, there, there's always that extra sense of, oh, a little bit of more pressure, I don't know, just because it was New Zealand, just because, you know, the last time we played them, uh, we had one, well, you know, apart from the World Cup, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, you know, like it was an amazing, amazing fixture to be a part of. I've got so many good friends still in that uh, New Zealand side. Dudes I went to school with, dudes I played uh, at Tasman with, played with at the Chiefs. Um, you know, there was, I remember Sam Kane was on the sideline. He was coming back from injury. The bastard was, you know, squirting water on me and um, just stuff like that. Like, they're still some of my best friends and uh, people I still text, wish them well before games. So um, the game was amazing, man. And uh, the boys put in some shift that day. Yeah. And mm. what about the famous, and I've faced it a couple of times, the hacker? Yeah. There's all this build up, you've done it, and yeah. it's spine tingling to watch. And I always say it's one of the coolest things yeah. in rugby. I know it's, it goes a lot deeper than being cool, there's mm. a, a real reason why it's done and, and the history behind that. But for you facing that, mm. what are you doing? Who are you looking at? Um, like, how does it work? Oh, uh, yeah. Like, I guess traditionally you're trying to, you know, look people in the eye, and um, it's a. Uh, you know, it's setting down a marker. It's it's a preparation for what's to come. Um, it was it was an amazing experience. I didn't look anyone specifically in the eye. You try. It's a weird thing. You're like trying to catch people's eyes, but everyone's just looking straight ahead. Um, you know, the photos afterwards were amazing. You see them in their formation and us standing there. Uh, you see, you know, some people are different. Oh, Jack Conan had a had a big old grin on his face before performing absolute outstanding, you know. Um, you know, I just sat, stood there with a blank face expression and took it all in for what it was. Um, it was an amazing experience, man. And, you know, I didn't think I'd face it once and I got to face it, you know, four times so far. It's, fuck, it's a pretty cool experience, man. Yeah. Did it feel weird at all? Uh, a little bit weird. I think the whole, you know, the whole week was a little bit weird, you know, because I had so many friends in the opposition team who I knew I was about to go on and try to kick the shit out of. So, um, you know, I knew that there was going to be a little bit, not bitterness, I guess, towards me, but there was going to be a little bit of chirping and things from on their side. But that's all part of sport, man. I understood that that was coming. There was nothing, no malice in it, but, um, you know, it was good to get one up on them, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And who's chirps in then? When I played against the All Blacks, they just kept asking, who are you? Who are you? <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't even know who myself is. Yeah. I don't even know. Um, Oh, you know, there's a, there's a usual suspects, uh, suspects like Brody Retallix, obviously. Uh, what, is he a big talker, is he? Uh, he is, he, he's, he's a surprising, yeah, he is, but like in fairness, I know 
yeah, I know him as Guzzler, man. He's a, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. I knew it was coming. But when he was starting to go, someone like Gary Ringrose or something, I was like, mate, Gary's one of the nicest guys. Please <laughs> try and pick on someone apart from Gary right now. Um, you know, Dane Coles, obviously, annoying as shit. Um, you know, like, that's all part of it. I had, you know, David Harvilli I went to school with. Ethan Blackadder I went to school with, Finlay Christie I played a lot of rugby with, so all those boys, you know, uh, it, was a, it was a digs on the ground and stuff that you, that you know you're going to get. They, I knew it was coming and, um, you know, fortunately we bloody put in a performance and um, walked away with a nice, nice win, yeah. Yeah, well I remember I posted a video on Twitter of you making that tackle because there'd been a bit of a build-up around <laughs> your defence and people yeah. looking for ills in your game. And yeah, you made that funny thing, isn't it? It is, yeah, it is. It really is. But ironically, you made that big hit. Yeah. That closed out the game. Let's just say that it did. But it, you can see the emotion on you. You yeah. did the old Ronaldo, oh, you know. Oh, you can't put me in that category. Um, no, but it was class. Yeah, and you could what, see the emotion coming out of you when that happened. Yeah, it was awesome, man. Like, I can't, um, you know, like that was, it's like someone had written a script, you know, for, the, for something like that to happen. I knew, man, people always talk shit, and that's all part of it, man. But... Half the people who are talking shit are the ones who have never, <laughs> never played a game of rugby in their lives. So I've, I understand that. I don't read too much into it, but um, I literally, it's one of those things where it almost happened in slow mo, and I saw it all happening before me. Um, you know, the break off the base, Pete Omani missing a tackle, an offload, David Harvilli goes through the gap, and um, you know, I had to close down a fair amount of space pretty quickly to try get Rico because he's absolutely electric, and I saw the pass come out of Davy's hand and just closed my eyes and hit him and then fortunately enough Pete got over the ball and got the turnover and Joey kicked the three and you know I think that gave us a little bit of a cushion so um, it happens that fast man but to me that literally happened in slow-mo and I can still see it now it's man it's a cool thing to have been a part of yeah yeah absolutely yeah. and I'm hearing that your dad was proud as punch as well to the fact that he had an Irish jersey with two pints of Guinness in his hand <laughs> yeah, knocking about in New Zealand oh he did man he's uh, without knowing it, he's the biggest, um, he wears all my kit, <laughs> like absolutely everything. <laughs> um, he was actually wearing a plane jersey of mine, not knowing it was an actual plane jersey. <laughs> he's a, oh no, he's he, he's an absolute legend. He walks around and literally um, Irish, <laughs> yeah, my Irish track pants and an Irish jumper with an Irish jacket. Like if you if you didn't know he was my dad, you'd think he's an Irishman who's who's over in Nelson doing uh, doing who knows. But uh, yeah, he was a pretty proud old man, and um, I'm just glad that you know he's he can walk around with an Irish jumper and no one can give him shit anymore. Yeah, yeah. And, with, and with them reactions when you win a game like that, mm. and not that I've been in many at the international stage <laughs> where they're like that, but like them big moments, and because of the history, mm. especially now when you play against the All Blacks. Was the shit talk over with them or not? Did they take it well? Uh, yeah, I'd say that they take it well. The thing about like about New Zealand, and I know they're not playing good rugby at the moment, you could say, but um, they've lost a few more test matches than what they normally do in a calendar year. But, man, they've still got the some of the best individuals in the world, and I don't think anyone can deny that. Uh, I think I'm hoping that they don't figure it all out before the World Cup because that could be very, very... Uh, that could be a scary prospect, but sure, look, uh, they took it well. They understood, you know, the next time we played them, which uh, happened to be at Eden Park, they got they got up against us. But, um, you know, there wasn't too much, you know, negative backlash, I guess, from them. They weren't pissed off at us. They understood that we played well, and uh, they didn't they didn't quite perform that day. So, um, no, there wasn't wasn't too much. When we were there, we were train. We were staying in the CBD. We were training 40 minutes out outside in North Harbour. Our gym, we had to share like a public gym with the rest of the, like you know all these little things sort of add up to making it a proper tour. Like obviously, Sexto's playing absolutely unbelievably and telling us where to go. I'm not. I'm not denying the fact that we've got you know the best ten in the world at the moment. You know, a lot of the Kiwis wouldn't have had a clue who Ty Furlong, Dan Sheehan, and uh, Andrew Porter was. Peter Romani, but Bundiaki oh. eating chicken. Not that it's the way they ate the chicken <laughs> yeah, or yeah, took yeah. the chicken. Oh, no. I loved it. That was, I mean, that's four o'clock in the morning after, you know, town had just shut. Let's talk mm. about that series win mm. 
in New Zealand. Unbelievable. Unbelievable yeah. to watch the way that it was done, the rivalry and the history that's now being created between the two teams. Yeah. Just talk us <clears throat> through what that was like. Um, yeah, it was awesome, man. Like, um, you know, like from New Zealand's point of view, you try and make the tours as hard as you can. Um, and, you know, when I was over, like, when we were there, we were train. We were staying in the CBD. We were training 40 minutes out outside in North Harbour. Our gym, we had to share like a public gym with the rest of the, like you know all these little things sort of add up to making it a proper tour. They they put your backs against the wall to see how you react and um, you know midweek games against the Māori All Blacks they're never easy. Um, and the you know the first two games it wasn't like we were shell shocked, but we just didn't perform as well as what we could. Um, you know we knew if we put in performance, like a good performance, that we were gonna do a job. And after that first test match, we were all a bit down, sat in the changing room sort of thinking, you know, there were a lot of what ifs, but, you know, Faz kind of said, lads, like, we're, we're fucking here now, and we know what we can do a lot better. And we were so close on so many occasions. Yeah, they had a couple of purple patches in that first test match and punished us for it, but, we knew if we got better and what we could do like we didn't do anything that we haven't done before you know we didn't pull rabbits out of the hats or score ridiculous tries from nothing we broke them down with you know playing good footy good irish footy structure pressure kicking at the right times doing the basics really really well that's how we did it <laughs> we didn't go down down there like i said and score like will jordan's try tries that he scores you know like we just played good footy and came out with a with a win. Yeah. What about you personally going home? Was that the first time you've been home? Um, home, I say. Yeah. Second back, home. Yeah, back yeah, to New Zealand. Back to New Zealand. Um, it was my first time since COVID. You know, so two and a half, three years. Um, and you know, it was an amazing. It was amazing to get back. I had you know so many friends and family that I hadn't caught up with yet. And you know, I was there for a week and a half before I even saw my parents and my sister. Um, so yeah, it was, it was nice to get back to New Zealand, um, for those reasons, but obviously there for business as well, it was, uh, my footy, my footy cap was on for most of the time, yeah. And what is it then? What is it about this Irish team? What is it about you? I know it's the fact that you're a sign of the times with such a good squad, mm. but why are you now beating the All Blacks? Have you got why? to that level? I, I think there's just a, a serious amount of inner belief in, in what we're doing and that we don't, need to, we don't need to do anything different to what we are doing. Um, it's probably a reflection on how the provinces are doing in fairness. You know, all of the Irish teams are, are starting to perform, even in Europe. Um, but like, we do the basics really, really well. Our shape, we, we a lot of detail on shape, like nothing. Everyone does it, you know, but like how well can you do it? How quick can you do it? How quick can you get set? How quick can you, how good is your catch and pass at the line? When you're under pressure, do you know where people are? How's your listening under pressure? Just things like that, man. And um, it comes with time in the saddle. It comes with, you know, coaches drilling it. Like obviously Sexto's playing absolutely unbelievably and telling us where to go. I'm not, I'm not denying the fact that we've got, you know, the best 10 in the world at the moment. Um, and then, you know, boys are just, like I said, we just believe in what we're doing is gonna, is gonna beat teams. And man, we're just playing good footy and got some of the best players. You know, look at our front row, man. Oh, front, savage. Like, it's, <laughs> heading into New Zealand, I would have said we would have had the best front row going around. And, you know, a lot of the Kiwis wouldn't have had a clue who Ty Furlong, Dan Sheehan, <laughs> and uh, Andrew Porter were. You know, like, we've got, we do have some of the best players in the world and I think people are starting to realise that, yeah. Well, that is the thing. I think if they didn't know before, they know now. And that, oh, brings, me, yeah, and that brings me on to my next question. One of the things around the All Blacks and historically we've seen and people mm. can dig out the interviews before <laughs> when they've spoken about other players in press conferences. I think Guzla, that's his name, isn't it? Yeah. Tell it. He's been asked, Sam, Sam Whitelock's been asked about players and you can see they actually don't even know yeah. who they're playing against. Yeah. That must have shifted now, especially with Ireland. Oh yeah, you'd think so. And I, I actually remember someone saying that in the changing room before we played against them. 
They don't know who we are. Yeah, they have no clue who we are. They're, that's literally it, man. You look, you, you'd look at press conferences and they wouldn't be able to name certain people. They'd see a starting lineup and wouldn't be able to tell you if they're left or right footed. Like that's stuff crazy. Like that. Why is that? Like concentrate on your own game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, still though, you need to know who your opponents are. But like in fairness, like even when I was in New Zealand, it, it's there would be a, le a little bit level of ig ignorance involved, but you just don't see the footy being played. It's played at three, four o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry, but I'm not waking up for a three or four o'clock in the morning to watch a game of footy. The only way I'm watching that is, that, you know, with a with a spice box coming home from Chinese after a <laughs> night out. That's the only time I'm watching that. Um, yeah, that's that is part of it. But I'm sure, like I know, I know now that everyone's everyone over that side of the world has been put on notice as, in terms of the Northern Hemisphere rugby. Not even us, man. Look at France, England, England are going like I I know England didn't play well in that last Six Nations. But man, their team is still very, very good. Scotland on their day, obviously, are going to beat anyone. Uh, mate, there's definitely going to be some competition coming into that World Cup. You've mentioned his name a few times, Jolly Sexton. <laughs> what do Ireland look like without him? Like, I, I mean, you'd be naive to think that we aren't dependent on Jonathan. Like, we're, even in that first test when he went off for an HIA and didn't come on, we weren't the same. We weren't as well oiled. We weren't as efficient. You know, there's a he he adds a sense of direction um, to a team, and you know he, he's I know he's an absolute psychopath, but when he does talk, you do listen, and he puts you in positions that are going to put you through holes or give you weak shoulders. Um, you know, so he's an easy man to follow around. Um, you know, it's it's not that I'm. He's just got so much experience that without him, you know, you're not lost. You, you're good rugby players, got to make decisions for yourself. But he, he just sees games so much. He sees things unfold so much quicker. He knows where space is going to be. He knows who we're trying to load up on attack or trying to pick on, things like that, man. It's, uh, he's very, very experienced and very, very good at his job. And the world of social media, we got mm. to be involved if you're on social media, yeah. in the celebrations after that famous <clears throat> series win down in New yeah. Zealand, how was that received? It kind of seemed to get washed under the carpet. Was there anything said? Peter Romani, but Bundiaki oh. eating chicken. Come Not that on, it's man. the way they ate the chicken <laughs> yeah, or yeah, took yeah. the chicken. Oh, no. I loved it. That was, I mean, that's four o'clock in the morning after the you know, town had just shut. I, I vividly remember we were all in this one place in town and um, you know they tried for hours to kick us out, they finally got us all out. Um, the ABs boys got chauffeured into their little minivan by security and taken back to the hotel and we were, we were left outside. And hungry. Was so, hungry, very yeah. hungry, yes. Um, and you know there was like pretty much a mosh pit going on of just Irish fans just singing and dancing and just enjoying themselves. There was absolutely no trouble. Like you could even see, you know, the guards in the middle of the road. They're just like, they're just having fun. There's no problems going on. And you see, you see Pete over there with Bundy around his arm. Like those two together, they're chalk and cheese, man. They're from two different places in the world, but they get on so well. Um, you know. Bundy, oh, Bundy stealing the chicken? Yeah, that was hilarious. I don't man. know, allegedly. Uh, allegedly, yeah, 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 but that's all, man, it's all, it's all harmless fun, you know, and I'm sure she didn't mind because it looked like she went viral as well, so yeah. uh, fair play, yeah. Yeah, but I love that though. I think there's an element of players being more guarded now. And you mm. mentioned the All Blacks getting put in a, a van because they're yeah. so famous. There's yeah. a football element to it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. the fact that you lads have gone and done that, you've enjoyed it, but with the fans as well and connecting yeah. with the fans as well. Yeah, I'm sure there's there's more than just that video on someone's phone going around, you know, of some someone sitting down on a pint in a corner of a pub. They, you know, that's that's all part of it. We're all human at the end of the day. And, um, you know, you've got to let your hair down every now and then. And um, I'm sure you know, 30, 40 years ago before social media, there was a lot more going on than that. So, um, man, it's, it's all part of being human, isn't it? You got to enjoy yourself when you win. Of course. And Andy Farrell, what's he like? Apart from being a hard northerner and one of the most <laughs> decorated human beings to ever walk the planet who yeah. have played rugby. He, he just looks like he's, it's just <laughs> a di he, well, we know he's cut from a different cloth, but mm. he just looks class in everything that he does. Yeah, he's a he's hard nosed bastard, man. Like he expects so highly of, of everyone but he expects so highly of himself as well. Like um, like I said earlier, he doesn't expect you to perform miracles, 
just to do your job to the best that you can. He will, through, through Monday through Friday to prep you for a week, he'll make sure that, you know, you've got to make sure that you've done all of your work to perform on Saturday. And he's an absolute, you know, he's a legend of the game. And when he speaks, you listen. He doesn't speak that often, but when he does, like before a training or something like that, man, it's time to switch on. Um, you know, there's sometimes on a Thursday he, he speaks before a training and you're ready for a game, you know, you get that horned up about it. But um, man, like, just expects, you know, he doesn't expect anything of you that he wouldn't expect of himself. Very, very good coach. He's got a good team around him. Um, can can have fun and be serious at the same time. You know, he's, he's the first one to crack a joke. Um, you know, he just, because he's recently been a player, he reads a room well. Um, knows when the boys need a cuddle, knows when the boys need to go and whack each other as well, which is a very, very good sign of a coach. So, um, no, nah, he's, he's good, man. He's very, very good. So the natural evolution of Irish fans watching this will be the World Cup. Mm. One thing I've always found weird is it's always about the World Cup, the four-year cycles. Yeah. But with Ireland, it feels like now you've done everything. You've done everything in the game internationally. It's all about a World Cup now. Yeah. Do you feel that pressure? Um... Yeah, and I, I, I think in this, you know, this year leading into it, it's going to be talked about every single week, sort of leading into it, um, how boys are performing, and you know, can they do it again? Can they prove people wrong? Can they, can they get past the quarter final? And um, you know, you look at our pool, we're probably in the pool of bloody death as well, you know. Um, and then the crossover, if we do manage to get through it, we've either got France or New Zealand, like as well, like it's. It doesn't get much uh, much harder than that, I think, when you look at the, you know, the top performing teams at the moment. So, um, look, <clears throat> I know if we're fit and healthy, uh, we're going to give it a bloody good shot. I think we've got the right people in the right positions. Uh, you know, we're playing rugby that's not going to, that's not going to drastically change between now and then. We've proved we can do it on the far side, far reaches of the earth. I, you know, I, I think we can definitely go to go to France and and perform. Yeah. And who is the team that you look at? You've dusted off the All Blacks, <laughs> you know, which you have without saying disrespectful. I know it's yeah, a lot harder yeah. than that, but, but what's the team that you look at or the, the team maybe collectively or you mm. with the lads that are looking at being like, look, these are the real deal. These are the ones we need to look out for. I know there'd be well, a number, but what's that one team? Well, I, you know, I alluded to France just then, and I think that's, that's everyone's boogie monster at the moment. You know, they're, um, they're young and youthful, uh, they're big and physical, yet they've got a nine and ten combo who who run the game like like I don't think anyone's ever seen before. Um, man, they're definitely they're definitely a team I think everybody should be worried about. But sure, look to win the World Cup, you got to beat the best at the best, and um, yeah, France are France are a scary scary prospect. Yeah. Right. Lastly, James, mm -hmm. do you feel like having done what you've done in the Irish jersey? that you've won the masses, and I go back to the taxi driver, not that you need to win him over, <laughs> but the general consensus was mixed, I think, just naturally with the yeah. Irish public and the media. Mm. Which, yeah, I think it's fair enough though, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not Irish born or anything, um, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here for another, you know, four or five years and hopefully until I retire. And then, you know, we see our life potentially being here after rugby as well, but like, I know that social media can be such an amazing, powerful tool and give, you know, give people a voice. But um, you know, I don't go looking for praise on there. I say like, if you if you go looking for the good, you you know, you're gonna you deserve to find all the bad as well. You know, that's all that's all part of it. And I understand that I'm not going to win over some of the Irish public, and fair enough. But um, you know, every time I get the opportunity to put on an Irish jumper, I'm going to do my absolute best to make sure that. Um, you know, it's in a better place than, than when I leave it. So, mate, that's, that's just it, man. I love mm. playing, playing for Ireland. Yeah. yeah, it's class. And you've had an amazing yeah. career. What's the dream? What's the motivation now? Um, well, I mean, obviously the World Cup. That's, that's, the, that's, you know, the next big thing. I know we've got Autumn Nations coming up. We've, you know, South Africa, Australia, Fiji, Six Nations. But, I mean... The carrot is, is the World Cup, you know, and um, just to go ahead and put in performances that we can be proud of, you know, like 
winning it would obviously be amazing, but you don't want to go there and not fire a shot. And I think Ireland against New Zealand in the last World Cup, you could argue that, you know, in that quarter final, they just didn't manage to fire a shot. So, um, mate, we're, we're looking forward to it and, um, you know, hopefully fit and ready and get selected, yeah. Yeah, class. Well, it's been wicked watching your career go from strength to strength mm. and here's to many more good days, great Cheers. days. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you.